Well, colour me mildly surprised. Normally when a popular show starts to noticeably decline in quality, it marks the beginning of an irreversible death spiral that inevitably leads to cancellation or the whole thing vanishing into irrelevancy. Just ask Westworld, or Game of Thrones. And so it seemed to be with Stranger Things, one of the most interesting new shows on Netflix when it first came out way back in 2016. When it first started, it was a compelling mystery with neat little touches of horror and dark fairy tale tragedy, and just the right amount of 1980s nostalgia that you almost felt you were watching some weird mashup of The Goonies, Halloween and E.T. Unfortunately, Season 2 was basically just an unimaginative retread of previous ground, minus the compelling mystery and sympathetic characters. Season 3, on the other hand, was marked by cast bloat, power creep, nostalgia burnout, and an unwelcome swerve towards goofy physical comedy, to the point where I even made a very pissy video complaining about how shit Stranger Things had become. It really felt like a show that had outlived its own premise, either making unsuccessful trips down creative dead ends, or falling back on the same tired tropes that were played out two seasons earlier, and I'd be lying if I said I had much enthusiasm for the long-delayed season 4. But holy shit, imagine my shock when I found myself once again pulled into a compelling storyline that teased whole new mysteries, rooting for a cast of characters that felt fresh and likeable and sympathetic again, and happily letting Netflix auto-load the next episode, eager to see what would happen next. If I didn't know better, I'd say that Stranger Things somehow got good again. But how the fuck did such a thing come to be? Well, grab your Walkman and join the drinker as we investigate together. The story kicks off about a year after the events of the previous season, where the main cast have all gone their different ways, resulting in multiple different storylines that are running concurrently but taking place in different parts of the worlds. The first plot line focuses on Eleven, who's struggling to make a new life for herself out in California with Joyce, Will and Jonathan. Her classmates don't take very well to her, and because she's socially naive and doesn't have her powers to magically fix any problem that comes her way, she's kind of vulnerable to their bullying. A visit from Mike leads to a disastrous confrontation at a roller disco and a falling out between the two of them. Meanwhile, to nobody's surprise, Hopper is alive, but not exactly well, in a Siberian prison camp. How exactly did he survive being at ground zero for an exploding particle accelerator? Well, he just kind of ducked, okay? Don't question it. The point is, he knows that his days in the Soviet Union are numbered unless he can break out, so he hatches a daring plan to contact Joyce back in America and get some help springing him from jail. Both of these things are basically sideshows to the main storyline, which takes place back in Hawkins, where the remaining characters get caught up in a series of gruesome murders, where the victims float up into the air and then get crunched up worse than a fucking UPS delivery. Clearly something supernatural is at work here, and as more people turn up dead, it's up to the gang to discover what's really going on and put a stop to it before the whole town gets destroyed. And their mission becomes even more urgent when one of their own gets targeted by the mysterious force that's hunting them. Like I say, there's a lot going on this season, and it's not until the epic final episode that the various plotlines all come together to resolve the main narrative. But what's impressive is that all three of these major plot threads are interesting and entertaining in their own rights. Unlike previous seasons, you never feel like you have to suffer through one tedious storyline to get to something more interesting, and everything moves along at a fast enough pace that you always feel like you're getting something out of it. Splitting the main characters up into different groups was a pretty good way of tackling one of my big criticisms of season 3, which was cast bloat. Every season had added new characters, and since very few of them ever died or left the story permanently, the obvious result was that there were far too many people and not enough things for them to do. Case in point, Lucas, who always felt like the odd man out of the group, just kind of hanging around in the background with no clear role and no particular character arc. But now he's become a conflicted teenager, torn between two different social groups, and his attempt to rebuild his relationship with Max now forms the backbone of a pretty satisfying arc for him. On that subject, the writers pulled off the seemingly impossible with this one and actually made me care about Max this season. I'd said in my previous video that she was probably one of the worst additions to this show, just a generic snarky girl that's moody and angry most of the time, drives a wedge between Elle and Mike for no particular reason, and generally acts like an arrogant bitch towards everyone, but somehow gets accepted into the group like an annoying ginger messiah. Even her abusive relationship with her brother couldn't make me warm to her. And yet here I was, rooting for her to pull through, gripped by a tense scene where she 
had to escape the antagonist and generally liking and empathising with her in a way that I never had before. I don't know if the extra years have given the actress a bit more maturity and nuance or if the writers were smart enough to realise that what they were doing just wasn't working, but either way, they absolutely nailed it this time around. Another big problem in season 3 was Eleven. Not only was she degenerating into a generic bratty teenager and losing the unique aspects of her character that made her so interesting, but she'd become overpowered to the point where she was fucking crippling the story. She was basically able to use her powers for almost anything with no cost to herself, and it practically became a meme that every single confrontation got resolved by her screaming in slow motion while suffering a nosebleeds. Now she's completely lost without her powers, and her main arc this season is her struggle to regain them while also delving deeper into her own past. I mean, yeah, the show is clearly retconning some of her personal history, but not to the point where it breaks her character completely. Basically what I'm saying here is that the writers managed to rediscover that compelling combination of vulnerability, childlike innocence, and dangerous unpredictability that made Eleven so fucking awesome in season one. I mean, if I had to be super picky, then I'd say that Mike, Will, and Jonathan are basically stuck in a holding pattern for a good chunk of the season until the plot decides it's time for them to step up and do something again. It's not a major issue because there's enough other things going on that you can kind of put them into the back of your mind, but it does leave them feeling a bit surplus to requirements this time around. And as for the new additions, Argyle is decent enough as a stoner working as a pizza delivery guy. He's basically there for comic relief and he's fine in small doses, but I'm glad that the writers didn't try to give him too much screen time. On the other hand, my Man of the Match award has got to go to Eddie, the leader of a fantasy roleplay group who witnesses two of the murders and basically gets framed for the whole thing. He's charismatic and dominant when he's in his element, but when the shit hits the fan, the bravado quickly vanishes and it becomes obvious that he's absolutely not a hero. But just like Hudson from Alien, he comes good in the end and delivers one of the most memorable performances the show's ever seen. I also have to give big props to the tonal shift this season. One of my big gripes about season 3 was the gradual descent into goofy comedy that completely destroyed the tension and drama that once made the show so gripping. But thank fuck, season 4 puts that right big time. The antagonist is a Freddy Krueger type character that gets inside your head, preying on all your subconscious fears and guilts and weaknesses before finally killing you in extremely gory fashion. It's dark and violent and brutal and the show doesn't shy away from any of it. Yeah, the mystery about who the antagonist really is and where he comes from will be pretty obvious to anyone that's been paying attention and it does try to pull a Blofeld from Spectre by suggesting that he was the guy secretly responsible for everything that's happened up to this point, but for the most part I think he's actually well handled. He's definitely way more interesting than the fucking mind flare, that's for sure. Overall, it really feels like the Duffer brothers watched my video bitching about season 3 and basically decided to work through it point by point, correcting each and every bone of contention along the way. I mean, I'm sure none of that's actually true and they don't even know who the hell I am, but I don't really care. Credit where credit's due, they correctly understood the problems and they set out to fix them, and that alone deserves praise these days considering how many arrogant arseholes are out there steadfastly refusing refusing to take the L in the face of all logic and reason. It's a pretty rare showrunner that has the wisdom to recognise they've fucked up, the humility to acknowledge it and the brains to actually put it right, but somehow the Duffer brothers have demonstrated all three. They took an ageing show with a worn out premise that I practically lost interest in and remade it into a genuinely compelling experience again. And personally, I'm excited to see how they round things out with the fifth and final season. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.